Okay, shall we take our first telephone question right now? Okay, hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from St. Paul, Minnesota. Welcome to the teleconference. What's your question, please? Okay. Um, my question is, what time frame are we looking at for rehabbing the average CVA? And I stress here average because I realize, uh, you know, they could all be different. Uh, using bow, bow bath principles. And then the second part of the question then is, how often must, quote, treatment sessions be given? Yes, that's the second part. How often must treatment sessions be given? Oh, good. I think that's a really, really very good question. And me working in Switzerland all the time, it's really so that people think, oh, yes, but you have more time to rehabilitate your patients and so forth and so on. It's so that we have our patients on the average of two months. And I think that uh, that's not a lot different than here. I think the average time here is about six weeks. I'll ask Jan in a minute. And the average treatment time now in our, but this is a rehab clinic now, just mm -hmm. to make that clear, is we have, PT has their patients at least two times a day with two different therapists for half an hour. It may be two different therapists always, though, for an hour and a half altogether. They also have OT, they may have speech, they may have water therapy, they may have quite a few things, but I'm just talking about PT. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we have patients about two months. And is this a five-day week schedule or a seven-day week this schedule? This is actually five days. Some of the more involved patients we do treat on Saturday, but they, everyone has at least Saturday afternoon and Sunday off. But Jan, do you want to make a comment about yeah. treatment here? I just wanted to mention one more thing on this, is that we get answer, asked this question a lot when we're giving our workshops. And with these patients, we're often asked, well, doesn't it take longer in, in in the United States or in Switzerland with bow bath techniques than it does with normal techniques. Mm -hmm. And we found that it almost is identical if you use the techniques that we're training as if um, compared to using traditional techniques. And we did, it was interesting, we did a swap. We had a physical therapist come from San Diego, from San Diego to Switzerland and one of our therapists went from Switzerland to San Diego. So we got to try using our techniques in the frame of reference in the time with utilization review and all in the United States. It's no problem at all. As it turned out, I think, yep, yeah, they were in the same time reference and there was no problem. Everything was about the same length of time. I think one patient wasn't able to get out. Um, they needed to use a cane, but that meant no braces, no canes, and the techniques were completely different. And the, the outcome was actually better with the bow bath The quality was better, right? The quality yeah. was much quality, better. Quality, the outcome is better, and the time frame is approximately the same. Approximately mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, then? Yes, one other uh, question. Sure. Does nursing then also uh, get involved in this, and do they carry through with mm -hmm. your treatment? Oh, that is such a fantastic question. Thank Did you, you very that much. That's from St. Paul. <laughs> the people in Minnesota are wonderful. Um, I'd like to say something here is that I have been working with our nursing staff and with the nursing staff around our area in Switzerland for the last year really very intensively. And we have been trying to get this team approach going. And it is, had, it has gone so well in our clinic. I mean, positioning happens at noon and the whole night through. And the nurses are doing gait training and the OTs are also doing gait training and the nurses are, I mean, it's just wonderful. And I know it works. And the nurses, yes, they do do this. They do it consequently, and they follow through, and it's wonderful. It and really it, is worth trying. If you do get the nurses involved, it increases the, um, it, it's much faster the results that oh, you yeah. get, mm -hmm. and you can get the sure. patients up and out a lot faster. Yes. It's a great a bonus to us as therapists to have the nursing staff help. And I just want to say mm -hmm. one more thing is that, we'll talk about this later, but we have to realize the nurses are the people who are with the patients most of the time. That's right. Sure. Not the PTs and not the OTs or anyone. They have the main time slot with the patient. And it's important that they're, on a, that they're really working with the team. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for your questions. Thanks. Let's take another call, shall we? Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? Um, Columbus, Ohio. Welcome to the teleconference. Go ahead with your question. How can you normalize the maximally increased extremities tone when that extremity is so painful that positioning is impossible? Could you just repeat that once more so I can get that? Okay. <laughs> How can you normalize a maximally increased um, extremity tone when the extremity is so painful that you can't do proper positioning? Is that the lower extremity or just the whole side? Um, 
the whole side. The whole side. Um, I think that's a, another good question. First of all, I would wonder why is this so painful? What what is painful? What is the reason for the pain? I'd get in contact with a physician and say, you know, what is the problem here? Uh, there is sometimes a lot of talk about thalamic pain, that it's really central pain. It could be just the purely the increased muscle tone. Now, if you mean positioning on the involved side doesn't work, or positioning? On the involved side, when the tone is really high that you can't position properly. Mm -hmm. Because often I found that the patients aren't that painful, but they're fearful. Mm -hmm. And the That's fear true. goes into pain. That's how they express this fear. And what I do is I start maybe in, in supine and start very gradually working onto the involved side. I don't try to put them straight on the involved side right away. Just go at an angle and try, try to increase the tolerance. I think that's the best way. Okay. Jan is nodding agreement, I mm -hmm. see. Right. Okay, thanks for your question. Okay. Shall we take a question from our studio audience here? Yes, go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Jenny Russell, a physical therapist at a rehab center in the Pittsburgh area. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, um, do the treatments of spasticity have a short-term or a long-term effect? In other words, if the spasticity is decreased during treatment, do you expect that decrease to last for an hour, 12 hours, or get carryover through the night? It, it depends, first of all, on how severe the spasticity is and the extent of the lesion. That will make a difference. And it depends on the treatment that you're using with the patient. Normally, it's starting out, you see more short-term effects with the patient. And what our goal is going to be is that the patient can eventually take over, learn to inhibit their own spasticity, feel the normal movements, and then you'll see long-term effects from it. In the beginning, it's normally short-term effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another point I'd like to make there is we have probably done a lot of inhibition during the treatment, but it's very important how they leave the treatment area. If they're positioned correctly in their wheelchair, then the the result will be more long-term. If they leave in a, in a bad posture, then it will be more short-term. We, we have to be careful. As we say, 24 hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your question. Shall we take another call now? Sure. OK, hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from, please? Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome to the teleconference. Go ahead with your question. Yes, can you explain the difference between hypertonicity and spasticity? Which of you would care to handle that? When we use it, when we use it treating yeah. the patients, and when we're talking today, we're using that interchangeably. That hypertonicity. You said hypertonicity? hypertonicity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That hypertonicity and spasticity we use interchangeably. It's an increase in muscle tone. And you have to decrease that tone in order to, no to normalize it and get normal movement. The important thing to remember in bow bath techniques is you can't put normal movement on top of abnormal tone. So you have to make sure you normalize the tone first. And we talk about spasticity and hypertonicity interchangeably. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your call. Shall we take another question from our studio audience? Go ahead. Uh, yes, my name's Pam Wickemeyer, and I'm a first-year therapist in the area. And I was wondering, many patients function fine with abnormal tone, and why is it, why is it important to have normal movement? Okay, that's the difference between treating a patient traditionally and treating with other techniques that we're trying to encourage now. It's that when you're treating patients traditionally, get them up, get them moving, and get them home as soon as possible. But the problem is, is we're often comparing patients with um, other patient populations. We'll say, you're doing really good. That's really good, but that's not normal. And what we want to have as our goal is in quality of life is to get that patient as normalized as possible. Mm -hmm. So we really have to change our thinking and think about what's the best for this patient, normal tone, and not just let's get them up and out as soon as possible. Okay, so it's, mm -hmm. it's a quality issue it's quality. That's right. what we're talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's take another question from our studio audience here in Pittsburgh. Go ahead, please. Hi. I'm Barb Tennant. I'm a certified occupational therapy okay. assistant from a rehab center in the Pittsburgh area. Mm -hmm. And my question is, um, with today's trend toward the decreased length of stay, mm -hmm. is it possible um, to accomplish with the bow back quality bow bath quality of treatment the, um, the, under such time constraints. Yeah. yeah, I think that sort of goes back to the question from St. Paul also. It's just like, uh, can you do such a good job in a short amount of time? I think so, yes. The other um, thing that we're lucky with here in the States, I don't mean yeah, to that's barge okay. in on that, <laughs> but in, the, in our clinic in Switzerland, we didn't have the avail availability to do a lot of outpatient treatment. 
And here in the States, that seems to be a lot easier. And if we can do more outpatient treatment, then you can increase that length of um, treating the patient even more. But we can get them out in the same length of time. Mm -hmm. That's not been a problem. Is that such a concern, of course, these days with hospitals sure and utilization exactly. review kinds of things that we were talking about before? That's right. Yeah. A lot of pressure on the therapist now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, what is the time response for, you, you were recommending weight bearing as a mm -hmm. treatment for spasticity. Mm -hmm. How long before you can see an effect from, from weight bearing? That's interesting because when, I mean, I can't say always, it's not always, but often one sees that when the patient is really, really weight bearing, that it's immediate. You, you can feel the, the spasticity release, and that's right there. And that's one of our, our cues as to when, it's not, when we're not weight-bearing properly because the spasticity does not release. Uh -huh. I mean, it, it happens that quickly. Mm -hmm. Does that then have a psychological benefit? You would, you would almost imagine that it would have to have on the patient. Mm -hmm. When the spasticity begins to go, then you want to do more. Mm -hmm. You want to participate more actively they in therapy. They get really excited. Yeah. 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 They get really excited about it. Okay. Well, those are all the questions that I think we're going to have time for during this segment, but I would like to remind you that if you refer to your teleconference information packet, you will see that there are two more question and answer periods coming up later on in the program. So if you have questions during the rest of the teleconference, just write them down and pass them along to your site coordinator. We're going to take a 15-minute break now, and when we come back, Jan will give us some specific tips on 24-hour management of the hemiplegic patient. During the break, you'll see on your TV screen a countdown clock indicating how much time is left until the teleconference starts again. And about a minute and a half before we start, we'll run our music to alert you to the fact that we're about to begin. We'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome back to Bow Bath Techniques for the Stroke Patient. We hope you've all made it back to your seats and have had a chance to stretch your legs a bit. Our next subject area for today's program deals with the 24-hour management of the adult hemiplegic. The bow bath approach is not restricted to the physical and occupational therapy clinics. It's an approach that's very practical and can be utilized 24 hours a day in every care setting. It is not mandatory to have the entire rehab team use the approach because bow bath isn't an all or nothing situation. However, the best results do come when everyone working with the patient understands and is trained in using bow bath techniques. Here now to give us some tips on how best to implement bow bath techniques on a 24-hour basis is Jan Davis. Jan, can we begin with some general pointers for people caring for hemiplegic patients, some ground rules mm -hmm. for care? There's some basic things that we can give information for the family and the staff working with patients that really can make an impact on their rehab program from day one when they come in the hospital. We have to think about what Louise was saying earlier that we are talking about the basic problems in hemiplegia, the shortening of the trunk, they have a lot of hypertonicity, they don't have a feeling of sensation, they don't integrate both sides of their body, they have a tendency to look away from the hemiside instead of toward the hemiside. And if we look at the problems in hemiplegia, then we can start to plan a program around those problems mm -hmm. and try to do as much as we can to integrate both sides of the body again and not make it a hemi half and half. Okay. There, oh. oh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> there are a few yeah. things that we can do right from the beginning. All right. First, and they seem so normal. They don't seem like they're anything exceptional at all, but they're things that we can do right away. First of all, always approach the patient from the hemi side, from his affected side. I think most people have a tendency to approach the patient from his strong side, thinking that he'll hear us better, mm -hmm. or he can't deal with that side anyway. Let's go to what he can deal with but that doesn't help him at all in integrating both sides of his body. That doesn't encourage him to look in that direction and, and try to integrate again. When you're doing this, the most important thing to do is maintain eye contact with the patient. You'll notice when you're working with patients, they'll tend to drift off. They're not looking at you. And a lot of patients have a visual field cut, a hemianopsia, where they have mm -hmm. trouble looking that direction anyway, and they need to learn compensation for this. What family members are encouraged to do specifically when they're talking to a patient, and most people do this anyway, they do this just automatically, is they'll take the patient's arm, give some tactile input, stroke their arm, take their hand, touch their shoulder on the affected side. People want to shy away from that mm -hmm. side because they're sick, but they're not sick any longer. They need to learn how to incorporate what they've got left. And that's a message to the patient, too, that says that, that that's okay with me, that's, that's right. okay with the professional working with you, so therefore it should be okay with that's you. That's right. I've heard stories sometimes of where 
people didn't want to touch that side, mm -hmm. and it gives the patient obviously a real bad feeling. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Another thing that you can do, the nursing staff can help us a lot in this area, is during nursing tasks, they can help the patient to become cognitively better as well. For example, when they're washing a patient or dressing a patient, they can actually name the body parts as they go along. So the patient becomes more aware of what's going on. It's not just a passive task. And is task explanation important yeah. too here? Is that part of the same process? The patients you? have so many problems anyway, the motor planning, the other problems in perception, that if the therapist or the nurse can tell them what's going on and help them along these lines, it really does make a difference. It can make such a difference for the patient. Another thing that we can do with the patients is, and especially nursing, is ask them to assist you. They're no longer sick at this point. They need to learn how to work with you. Now, I can't expect the patient from day one to be able to do everything for themselves, and I'm not going to frustrate the patient by saying that. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we have to ask the patients to start doing things for themselves. And I think this nursing will tend to do this at the beginning, and then the therapist will come into that picture as well. Mm -hmm. How do you find that delicate balance between giving too much help um, and making the patient dependent and giving too little help and making the patient frustrated? How, uh, do you have any yeah. guidelines for us? That's frustrating. I'm sure as everybody in the audience knows, that's really mm -hmm. frustrating to know, as a therapist it's frustrating to know how much we should do for them and how much we should wait. There's a technique that we use a lot in Switzerland that we call guiding. And it's very similar to when anybody who's a mother and works with children that they'll take their hand and put that over their hand and they'll help them put on their shoes and their socks and their jacket. And this sort of thing is a very normal situation. It's very normal to help someone with your hand over theirs in the same movement. And that's what we try to do with patients. So instead of passively putting a shirt on a patient, if the patient isn't able to put it on himself, then we can guide with our hand over their hand and help them to slide it up on their arm. It works easily and it works really well with patients who are apraxic or a phasic where they don't understand the command. Mm -hmm. So the patient is, is minimally going through the motions, but gradually as recovery takes place can take, can over. take over more and the guidance becomes That's nice right. and That's less. That's exactly right. Yeah. How about, um, how do you deal with the shoulder during all of this? We have to, the shoulder is really important yeah. as we'll talk about in a few minutes, some more specifics of the yeah. hemiplegic shoulder, but we can't neglect it at this point. Often the patient in an acute hospital has an IV. Mm -hmm. They're laying in bed. They're in an acute situation. People tend to just let that arm lay there. The IV is normally in the hemi side anyway, so they can do things with their strong side, and they forget about this arm. And then you can have some problems with contractures and pain. So what you have to make sure that you do is incorporate that hemi arm in from the beginning, from day one with these patients. And a trick that you can do is even that well, first of all, you can move the arm, even with an IV in it. Today they have such nice flexible needles and all with IVs that you can lift up the whole arm in the IV and do some range of motion. If that's not possible with your patient, you can actually have them lay their arm on the bed, move the body against the arm, and you're still getting some nice range of motion with the arm and the shoulder and against the body instead of moving the arm in this direction. And right from the beginning we should be doing yeah, this. Yeah, it really is important. Yeah. Another thing that nursing needs to help the patient take care of his bowel and bladder programs. That's something that should be introduced to the patient in order to increase their independence. And also the problem of NG tubes, nasogastral tubes. Mm -hmm. The patient with an NG tube often has that left in just too long. And therapists and the nurses should work together with oral motor facilitation and begin a feeding and swallowing program as soon as possible. It's, I think, a, a natural tendency in, in an awful lot of situations to say, well, we'll deal with all of the medical problems, and then we'll begin the, the therapeutic approach. But what you're saying is that immediately That's you right. should begin applying it. If people, don't, people think that rehab doesn't start until the patient walks into the, or right. rolls into the clinic, into the PT gym or into mm -hmm. the OT clinic, and that's just not true. Rehab starts right at the time that the nursing um, staff work with the patient, and they can give us such a head start. It's really a bonus for us when we have good nursing personnel that can help take over. And the PTs and OTs can help the nursing staff as well learn these techniques. Let's talk a little bit about a room for a hemiplegic patient. Are there some ways to set up a patient's room that are better than others when you're dealing with a particularly hemiplegic patient? The important thing is that we don't disregard that hemi side. We want to bombard that side with as much stimulation as we can. And that means that when someone enters the room, they should go to his hemi-side, like I mentioned. Put all of the things that are necessary for that patient on his hemi-side. 
and also have him face, for example, the door or whatever the most stimulation would be in that room, have him face that direction. And that can also help him to rotate and integrate. I think it might be a little bit more helpful now. We took a video at Harmerville, mm -hmm. and I thought we can show some of these things with an actual patient in his room. OK, and you can talk us through the tape then. Good. Here we have the videotape. We can see that the nurse is approaching again the patient from his weak side. This is a patient at Harmerville who is a left hemiplegic. And she approaches him from his left side, his hemi side, and that encourages him to look in that direction. He's rotating his head in that direction. And again, it's helping him to integrate a little bit better. His nightstand is over on that side, the coffee, the water, telephone, newspaper, whatever things, whatever he would need would be on that side of his bed. This helps the patient immensely. It's things that we wouldn't normally think about. But, and people often will say, this is mean. You can't do this to a patient. But actually, if you think about it, trying to drink a glass from a glass of water or pick something up, it's easier to rotate across your body than it is to pick that up straight. This nurse here is working really nicely with the patient. She's asking him questions from that side. She's helping him cognitively. She offers him, for example, a newspaper. And he can reach over and get it. Again, he's getting that trunk rotation Louise mentioned. He has weight bearing on that side. He's turning his head toward that side. And just the whole approach, it's a whole 24-hour program, and it starts with the hospital. It starts with the bed positioning right there. This really, it makes such a difference. People think these are minimal sorts of things, but it really does make a difference. If you can get the patient in the proper position in the room, you can add a lot to his rehab program. Here the patient is, um, we're going to be using the same patient in a few minutes to talk about bed positioning. OK. It's, that's, that's an unusual approach to, to do everything from the hemi side because that is not our inclination at that's all. Right. But you can see how it works logically. You're pulling that by having life on this side and life on that mm -hmm. side. You're pulling that side, the hemi side, back into the land of the living in, in that's effect, right. psychologically and physically. I didn't realize how much potential patients had until I went to Valence and started working with this approach. Because I had always worked in a traditional setting where we're teaching the patient compensation mm -hmm. techniques. And that means they do everything with the strong side. And unless sure. they have function in the weak side, forget it. And I found that they have a lot more potential than we had thought. Mm -hmm. well, of the entire rehab team, it, it's generally the nurse who spends the greatest amount of time dealing with the patient. Um, and one activity, of course, that nurses do a lot is positioning. And you mentioned it, that you, we were going to talk about positioning. I would like to ask mm -hmm. you to do that now. How, how does positioning in the bed fit in with Bobeth principle? Positioning is something that nurses have to do in any case. Mm -hmm. And we found through specific positioning techniques that we can normalize tone. Going back to what Louise said earlier, talk about the problems of the hemi, the shortening of the trunk, and all of these different problems with pain and contractures. If they're properly positioned in the beginning, it can make a big difference. It really does help a lot. They, um, if patients are positioned from the beginning at the time of admission properly, they tend to accept it a lot better. If they have a little bit more problem accepting it, if they had done normal or traditional bed positioning, for example, just supine, then they have trouble accepting that later on. But it doesn't mean it can't be done. Again, we have another videotape here showing the same patient. And he's being positioned in three different positions. First, the, the nurse again enters the room. She's going to explain now to the patient what she's doing. And he's been positioned here supine. And she's going to have him be positioned into um, side lying on his hemiplegic side. That, we feel, is the most important position. And it has the most influence on spasticity and also in the overall integration of both sides of his body. What she'll have the patient do now, if he can't do something on his own, she'll help him by guiding his hands. For example, she wants him to clasp his hands here. He doesn't really understand what he's supposed to do, so she brings his right arm over, although that's not his weak side. And then he takes care of that hemi arm by clasping his hands together. He can bend his own right leg. That's his strong side now. And his left leg, he'll need a little bit more help. And she can help the patient to bend his leg up. By getting a lot of hip flexion and knee flexion, you can help to decrease extension synergies in the lower extremity. So that's an inhibiting position. She rolls him over to the side. He's taking care of his arm. And make sure that he comes onto a scapula and not onto the head of the humerus, because that can be pretty painful for patients. Now this patient, because he's just rolled over, he needs to scoot back in bed a bit. This is a trick or a technique that nurses can use pretty well. 
She clasps her hands under his uh, chest and again under his pelvis and just slides him back to the edge of the bed. Her reference point here is that his back should be parallel with the edge of the bed and not in a lot of thoracic flexion. And now the patient's ready to um, have some pillows placed to help support him in this position a little bit more comfortably. The long pillows are nice, but you don't have to have special pillows in order to, to do proper positioning here. Now this is his unaffected leg or his right leg right now, but again it should be um, supported on a pillow and positioned forward into a little bit of flexion. His affected leg, his left leg is underneath and then she'll bring his knee back a little bit into flexion there to break up that extensor tone. That's the strongest tone of the lower extremity. The shoulder is important. That scapula needs to be brought forward into nice protraction. Don't pull on his arm. Slide your hand under his, behind his shoulder like the nurse is doing here and guide him forward and get him nicely into protraction. If you're feeling any winging at all in the scapula, then you know that he's not full enough into protraction. His head should be placed in midline on the pillow and a little bit elevated since there is some tightening on that, on the neck, on the hemi side. And then double check to make sure that his arm and his leg are in a good position here. Using the back again as the reference point to make sure it's parallel with the edge of the bed. A lot of patients have a tendency to roll back into supine. And so you can take a pillow like Pat's doing here, place it behind him, and that will help him to keep from rolling back onto supine and to mm -hmm. flat on his back. And it helps him also, he can rest a little bit against that pillow, against the, the railing this on the hospital bed. This is maybe a good point for the one caller right. who was asking about that. Okay, here, mm -hmm. let's take a pan and see exactly what we're supposed to be looking for. The wrist should be an extension or flat on the bed. Don't let it fall over into pronation with flexion. The elbow is nicely extended. You have at least 90 degrees of shoulder flexion and full protraction of the, the scapula in the shoulder. The head's positioned nicely on the pillow. It's elevated a little bit. He's resting comfortably. He's resting back a bit on the pillow. And again, his back is straight, not in thoracic flexion. And his leg here is just positioned comfortably forward on a pillow. If patients are positioned this way from the beginning, you really can help to integrate through proper weight bearing and inhibition of tone. And they don't mind. It's a comfortable position to be in. Now, the second one that we'll see is positioning in supine, meaning lying flat on your back. We don't recommend this so much because it tends to increase a little bit more of the extensor tone, and it doesn't inhibit spasticity as nicely. But this is a, a positioning technique that you can use with your patients. It's an easy one to use. What you have to do is just lift up the pillow, put it underneath his hip there in order to keep the hip from retracting, pulling back. His arm is placed on the pillow in elevation with some nice supination and with extension at the elbow again. Now the top of the pillow can be placed under shoulder to keep that from hanging back. So it doesn't hang back into shoulder retraction but keeps it forward at least as level as the other shoulder. That's important. The patient is pretty comfortable in this position, but remember that you don't want to put any pillows underneath his knees because that can increase flexion contracture at the knees. And also, we don't use a footboard against his feet because pushing or the, the input, um, sensory input of the footboard can keep the patient pushing against that, and that's going to cause some more spasticity. So the hip, the shoulder, the arms elevated, nice supination, and the head is in midline. That's a pretty good position for him here. Now the third position that we're going to see is positioning the patient on his non-hemi side. And again, because he's been in supine, the nurse is going to have to shift him over to the other edge of the bed. Now she has him clasps his hands again. Again, she guides him if he has any trouble. It helps him to take care of that side so he doesn't roll over onto it, have any pain where he has any neglect on that side. Again, she asks him to raise his right knee and flex as far as possible to keep that leg, or the hemi leg now, from shooting out into an extensor tone. She can help him here by flexing as much as possible. And her grip is important. Take a look at her grip. Hold, she holds her hand on above her knee and her pull is down and forward. And she gives some input with her right hand to help the patient bridge. Now he lifts up his hips and he scoots right on over. This is a nice position and it's also a nice way to have nursing have a bedpan put underneath a patient's mm -hmm. hips. It works real well. 
Again, she pulls, gives him some input at the hip, and he bridges on over and comes to the edge of the bed. That looks real nice. She did that very nicely. Now again, she needs to have him roll over to the side. And now he's rolling onto his right side or his unaffected side. And she'll be positioning his left side, the side that's up on top now. She needs to scoot him back a little bit. After you roll, you'll be surprised. You still have to scoot him back a little bit. She grabs under his pelvis, or here his hips, and again under his chest. And she doesn't lift with her back, but she just slides him along the edge of the bed, up to the edge of the bed. And that works out real well. Now his back, again, should be parallel with the edge of the bed. We don't want a lot of flexion in the trunk or thoracic flexion. That isn't going to be a nice inhibiting position. And putting up the bed rails, of course, will be another thing that you have to do for safety reasons. Now, when you're talking about bed positioning, think again about what's normal in your nursing um, procedures for your hospital or rehabilitation center. You want to be able to maintain the same procedures that the nurses do for decubitide control or bed sores. And so if they're turned every two hours or every three mm -hmm. hours, make sure you follow what your nursing procedure should be. And it really does make a difference here. Now, the long pillows again help. It's not necessary, but they do make a difference here with the patient, especially if someone's quite tall. But she'll take the pillow now and she's going to check, first of all, his arm and make sure that that is not pulling back because that can be painful into retraction. Make sure that the full arm is supported. You want to make sure again that you don't tug on his arm, that you're working from proximal to distal. She helps to get at least 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. And again, the shoulder should be fully protracted. That scapula should come forward and not be pulling back. The arm should be fully supported on the pillow. You don't want the hand or the wrist to be dropping off the end of the pillow. The drawings, I think, will help in your manual. When you go back to your centers, you can use these as a reference. Now, another thing that we have to watch for, because his left leg or his hemi leg is up on top now, is that he's fully supported with his left leg. Now she can cradle his leg in her arm here and bring it forward. If a patient can help, great. Encourage the patient to help you. But his leg is fully supported here. He's got his knee to his toes supported. You don't want any kind of inversion or his foot falling off the end of the pillow. Now some patients will have some lateral shortening on that trunk. And especially if they have large hips and a small waist, you'll see this even more often. You can roll up a pillow, a towel, or take, for example, a small cervical pillow and place that like Pat's doing here underneath his side, and that helps to get some more lengthening on the hemiplegic side. And that lengthens his side and helps to reduce some of the tone. Now again, if we take a good look at him, he has his wrist and his hand fully supported. His arm is in at least 90 degrees of flexion with good shoulder protraction. He's been lengthened along his hemiplegic side by putting a roll underneath. His hip is forward into flexion, his knees into flexion, and his foot and his ankle are fully supported on the pillow. They're not dropping off at all into inversion. And this is also a very comfortable position. The two sideline positions seem to be the best for the patients to gain the goals that we're going after. Mm -hmm. Another position that patients are often in in the acute hospital is sitting up in bed. Now this patient is sitting up in bed. What we want to encourage is nice flexion at the hips because they go into extension synergy and you'll see them sliding to the foot of the bed. And that's what we call the international position for these patients. We want to break that up. You can break it up by bringing the back of the bed up and placing pillows in order to get him into full upright position. And again, have his legs forward with nice flexion at the hips and make sure his forearms are fully supported on the table, that you don't have any problem with the arm hanging off the mm -hmm. table. In some cases, that's caused problems with ulnar nerve damage. Okay. Jen, if, if the patient complains of pain when he's positioned in bed on his affected side, is it a good idea to, to insist or ask that he stay in that position just despite the pain? Will that pass or what? No, you don't want to. There's a traditional saying in the past, no pain, no gain. That is not what we're going after mm -hmm. here. There's a reason for the pain. Usually patients have pain if they're pulling back and the spasticity causes a lot of the patient's pain. And what you have to do, again, is to reduce the tone. You, have to, you might have to, with somebody who's very spastic, very tight or painful, take a couple extra minutes in positioning the patient, try to inhibit a little bit of that tone, 
and then put them in the proper position. If a patient has contractures, do as much as you can. And maybe in three or four days, you'll see a, enough progress mm -hmm. that you can get more of the total um, position in bed. But you should respect the patient's pain and let that help sure. to, to guide yeah. you. That's yeah. real important. You're right, that is not the traditional approach very no. often. <laughs> yeah. um, is it possible to integrate Bobath principles in cases where the individual patients have additional medical problems, um, things like um, edema? Edema is a problem we have to be very careful about, and there are a lot of things we can do to reduce that, whether it's in the foot or the hand. The thing to remember when we're talking about bow bath methods, people sometimes look at this as a recipe book, mm -hmm. and I must do everything exactly the way they have just shown us. Every patient's a little bit different. They might have had a hip fracture. They might have had other problems. The size of the patient can make a difference, their lesion. And what you have to look at is the patient and his problems, and that's where observation skills come in again. If you know the principles, you know the basics of what you want to do, the rest of it will come. And speaking of principles, one last question. Can and should families learn the basics of bow bath bed positioning for use at home after, after discharge? Is that a good idea? I think it's important. You need to look again and see what the patient's are, needs are at the time of discharge. Mm -hmm. Some patients might be so advanced that that's no longer necessary. But for the patients where it is important and it will make a difference, then the, pa the patient's family should be trained. And that might be something mm -hmm. for nursing staff and therapy staff to, right. to watch out for, to offer perhaps to help them. It's not difficult, but make sure you don't just show them and expect them to have it. Make sure yeah. you do it together with the family. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks, Jan. Sure. Before we go into our next content area, which is transfers, I would like to remind you that coming up shortly right after the transfers and ADL sections is another question and answer period. You can call your questions in any time now, and remember, the sooner you get your questions into us, the better your chances of getting them on the air. The number again is area 412-621-7161. Patients, when they're transferring, are traditionally taught to stand by using a grab bar or by pushing up from the armrests of the wheelchair. Unfortunately, transferring in this traditional manner reinforces neglect of the hemicide and can trigger associated reactions of the upper extremity, causing increased spasticity. The most unfortunate result of teaching the patient to transfer in the traditional way is that the patient becomes dependent upon assistance. Louise and Jan have some specific techniques that can be used to help avoid this problem. Techniques that emphasize incorporating the affected side of the body. Jan and Louise? Good, thank you. Yes, I think transfers are a major part of our treatment. Of course, the nursing staff has to get the patient from bed into the chair in the morning. PTs have to get them from the wheelchair onto the plinth, and the OT should, should be getting them from their chair onto another normal chair during their treatment. But often we're probably frightened that something will happen during the time we're pivoting or whatever. It's just like a, a funny feeling. And I know sometimes I have it, and I imagine that probably some of you have this too. And what is most interesting here is that, as Susan has already said, we do teach our patients to transfer to the involved side, not to the uninvolved side. And that is different. And why do we do that? First of all, as we've already mentioned several times, is we are not teaching our patients to compensate. We're teaching them to use both of their legs and both sides of their trunk. We're teaching them to really integrate and to be aware of both of his sides. And we're trying to teach him to be safe. And you say, well, how can he be safe if he's going over to the involved side? Good, that's a good question, and I'll, I'll show you that. Now, I'll try to show you that, yes. I'm first going to demonstrate a maximal one-person transfer. Now, I'm really glad because the dra graphics department made little sketches for you, which are in your manual. It's not easy to hear this once, 
and just see it once and be able to do it, it's good that you have something to check back onto. Now, there's some major, major points with doing transfers. First of all, we practiced this morning standing up and sitting down. Well, now is one of the reasons why we did that and why I wanted you to feel how forward you have to come. A patient will more than likely be frightened to come far enough forward. We have to teach him that. Just because he's afraid of it doesn't mean that we can't teach him how to do it. Good. The patient's going to have to come far forward. But, of course, we're going to have to keep this under control, especially when they're not far enough to be able to do it by themselves. Now, here are the tips. Please remember, I'm going to show you three possibilities. That doesn't mean that you have to do it exactly the way we are showing you. These are things that I've found to work for myself, but you can do it a different way. But just remember the principles. That's the main thing. Good. Now, first, I am going to transfer Jan over her right involved side. Yes. <laughs> Good. First of all, we will put the foot under her knee. That's important, that we don't have too far forward or also too far backward. Now, second of all, I have to keep this knee under control. This leg can probably help, but this leg might may need a lot of support. Now, the way I'm going to do this is so that I'm going to bring both of my knees together and put her knee right between. I am not going to be bringing my knees directly on to her patella or onto her tibial tuberosity. I'm coming in at an angle so that I can, with my legs, approximate, you see this, into her hip. Because I'll be using leverage. I will not be lifting her. I will be using leverage and pivoting her over. Please do not lift. It is not good for your back. This is a... a transfer. This is a maximum assist transfer, and this is a transfer that the nurses will say a two-person maximum assist or a Hoyer lift. And a small therapist, doesn't matter their size, can do it because it's just a matter of leverage. Yeah. It's real easy. This is important. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is, get your knees right. Do not try to clasp their upper or um, their leg between your knees, because you're going to have to adduct and hold them, and at the same try keep Try, time, try to prevent them from slipping through. Keep your knees together and just bring the uh, patella in between. Now what I always do is put my foot that's away from the bed between the patient's knees. This foot that's next to the bed, I put back. So I have a chance to rock back and forth. If I'm parallel with my feet, there's nowhere for me to go. I can't use leverage because I have no chance. So knees together like this, and one foot back and go down into flexion. This is going to save my back. You'll see that in a minute. OK. Foot between her knees, my knees together, and approximation. Now, patient is going to fold her hands. I want her to take care of her upper extremity. And I want to keep her symmetric. Maybe I can do it, but now I want her to have the responsibility of taking care of it. The next thing is I'm going to bring her into forward flexion. Here, a main thing is they say, yeah, but she's going to fall over. Well, no, she's not going to fall forward into flexion because her legs are blocking that. She's not going to fall to me because I'm there. And she's not going to fall here, and I'll show you why in a minute. Now, first of all, this scapula is going to come onto my leg, onto my thigh. It's in protraction. I'm inhibiting this side at the same time. I'm going to lock her trunk in right here with my upper arm. And I'm going to come and take her on the trochanters. Now, what I'm going to do, I'll just show you what I'm going to do, is I'm going to shift my weight against her weight and do this. It's just rocking. Now, please notice, I do not do this. No. Don't go very far. <laughs> Good. I'm going to lock myself in. I'm going to approximate at her knees. I'm going to think, all right, in order to do a proper transfer, I have to shift her weight onto her feet. She is now on her feet. I am going to pivot and sit and up. 
Yeah? It's a nice view from the back, isn't it? <laughs> We're going to have to hurry. All right, it. come on. Good. That was a maximal transfer. And it's leverage. It's not lifting. It Please. takes a lot of practice. It, takes it really practice. does take a lot of practice. Sure, because you're yeah. used to lifting, but don't lock yourself in and go with the motion. And another thing that I'll show you in this transfer is coming into the moderate transfer. Once again, I'm not going to have to help her as much because she's getting better. She's learning, or she's just plain better. Good. Now, this is time I'm going to have her come forward again because you have to. I'm going to put my hands on her scapula. Her scapula is going to come into protraction. I'm going to help her over her feet, turn, and sit. I'm still on the involved side, so she can't fall. I have her. My knee is here in case. Everything's fine. One thing I'd like you to be aware of is that this is very controlled. I'm trying to teach her something. It's just not a matter of me getting her from here to there. I'm teaching her how to do it herself. That's important. Well, actually, this is normal, too. If I wanted to sit there, i go like this, right? I don't stand up, go into full extension, turn around, and sit down again. That's just not normal. No. OK. <laughs> no, I just, just want to throw that in there. <laughs> I am normal, yes, right? Yes, you're doing okay, just fine, thanks. yes. <laughs> Another thing I'd like to make sure is that the reason I was making this teaching point is that usually what we see is something that looks like this. You ready? Hang on now. One, <laughs> two, three, <laughs> you cock. <laughs> All right. And that's just with a lot of swing, and I'm going to get her over there. But it, she has no control, really, of the motion. I'm just getting her over. And this one, two, three, OK, not that you can't say one, two, three, but make sure that the point is she comes onto her feet. I know she's ready. And then she makes the transfer. Good? The last one I'd like to show you is a minimal transfer. This person is she's doing just fine. And I'm still going to have her fold her hands. But this time, I'm going to do guiding, the same thing that Jan was talking about before. I'm going to bring her forward. I'm going to just, I'm not going to bring her, excuse me. I'm going to guide her forward. I'm going to show her where, when she's up, I'm just giving her the information, do this. Show the knee again. Good. That's real. Mm -hmm. The hands come forward. She gets her weight onto her feet. Now what I'm doing is I'm taking her knee and bringing it over. I'm doing this sort of motion. That but gives it, me the information to turn my it body. It says, move your hips over. And one does it automatically. That goes back to these normal postural. <laughs> no, don't let go. <laughs> reactions. You take every chance. <laughs> normal postural reactions. One follows. Some follow better. Good dancers, good women who can really dance, they follow really well. Let's go. I follow less well. Well, <clears throat> good. <laughs> now I'd like you say, oh, yeah, that looks really easy with Jan. She's been doing that thousands of times with you. So once again, we made another tape at Harmerville. And we'll look at this being done with a patient. Good. Now, here's a maximal transfer. He doesn't really like coming forward, but then he thinks, oh, yeah, I guess I will do it. And she's transferring to the involved side. She has her hands on his trochanters. The first time, they didn't quite make it. Now she's up, turn, and down. And she's right there on the involved side in case he loses his balance or whatever. And this transfer feels really solid. Here's mm -hmm. another example of a moderate transfer. This time, the patient has a chair as a goal. He knows my hands belong there. Now I lift up, turn, and sit. It's nice sometimes to give the patient a goal. Then he knows exactly where the hands are supposed to stay. And then coming to the easier transfer, the minimal transfer, once again, guiding him forward, turn, and sit. He's really doing it by himself. We're just there showing him how it goes. And at the end, he will be doing this transfer totally alone, totally independently. And you have the positive action in that if a patient sits down in a chair like this, and he's going down on one side, and he only is standing on one leg, this chair might slip out from under him, and he's already on his way down. His weight is behind center of gravity. He's going to fall. Now, if we teach our patients 
to sit down the way we have said. She's going to be up, come on up, and then she's going to be sitting down. Now if that chair slips out, she can stand up again. But that's important, that's safe, and that's really independent, and not something else. Good, now another thing, another question people always have is, yeah, how do you get the patient from sitting to standing? Good, I'll show you how we do that. First of all, if I want to bring her into standing, I'll have her clasp her hands again. This really does help you with the symmetry, that, things, that the arm isn't pulling into retraction. It also gives them a cue to get their weight going forward right. instead of hanging back. Mm -hmm. And she's coming forward, and what I'll do is, now I'm going to take her at her knee, bring her forward, her hips come up, and I come up with her like this. I can bring my knee in front in case she buckles, I'm there. She can't hyperextend because I'm there too, and I have her pelvis and she's up. When I want her to sit down again, I'll give her information from my shoulder saying forward flexion, bring her knee forward to flex and sit. And that's how she comes from sitting to standing. Good? Wheelchair. Now what I'd like to show you is we've talked about wheelchair positioning. Just happen to have a wheelchair. And as we said, the patients sit in these chairs how many hours a day, at least ours do, and the thing we've seen is they, of course, build wonderful chairs these days. But no matter what you do, these vinyl seats and backs stretch out. And what happens when the seat stretches out is that the patient will be sitting and is forced into internal rotation and thoracic flexion. Of the legs. And they sit like this. I'm rolled in like this. And if I get a little bit of extension tone, then I'm like this. And then they stand like this. They've lost their extensor tone. So what do we do about that? Good. We, there's a real, really, really easy, simple solution. Is that we have just taken things like a plywood board and put it into the seat part. And here we just have a cushion. You can do either this or make a nice fancy thing like this, or even buy it, of course. That's, once again, plywood with foam rubber covered with, with vinyl. And then we have that in the back of the chair. Now that is really easy. Jan, could you sit in the chair? Now what I have here is, I have the thoracic extension. I have her flexed, if I put the uh, foot plate down. I have her flexed at the hips. Now, have you ever wondered, <laughs> oh yes, have you ever wondered <laughs> uh, why a patient slips in the wheelchair? My question is, is the patient slipping or is he <clears throat> extending and pushing himself into this banana position? Probably he's getting spasticity into the extensors in his hips. He's pushing back and he's going to slide himself right on out. And the positive thing about this is, I'll show the, the other thing later, is that when he's sitting on these hard surfaces, I can have real hip flexion, and real hip flexion inhibits the extensor tone. And therefore, I've inhibited the spasticity, and he can stay in this position. That's really important. And if he sits like this all day, if it's all day, I mean, he won't be sitting there all day, but then he has a better chance to come to uh, grips with his spasticity. But what happens if this patient of mine has slipped down into this spastic position? Thank you. And I'm thinking, oh, geez, there he is again. <laughs> and he's rolling That's how it looks, said, right? Everybody laughs, but that's and how it looks. he's rolling along. I said, um, Ms. Davis, would you mind um, stopping your rolling? I'm going to lock the wheelchair here. Good. And then I'm going to come around back, and I'm going to say, I'm going to set you up. <laughs> like that. And she sits there, yes. <laughs> and now I have probably given myself a hernia in the desk. And given me a shoulder problem. I've ruined her shoulder. And it's absolutely passive. Absolutely passive. You got her. And it's not normal. So what I do is, I'm sure you can all imagine by now, put her foot onto the floor. I'm going to come around to the front. Block her knees, just like I did before. Have her fold her hands. Come forward. Lift up her seat and sit. 
and she's learned once again how she should reposition herself and how she should normally correct her own posture. Can we try that one more time sideways? Just so everybody can see that? Because this is a technique that you can show nursing staff. They pick it up real fast. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And it, it makes their life easier. And anytime you can show nursing staff something that makes their life easier. Hmm. Actually, we should be showing all the staff, because all of us should be doing these corrections. Not just poor just nursing. Just real quick, just show. Yeah. Foot down, hands clasped, knee blocked, come forward, lift, and sit. And there you are. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, Susan. Jan and Louise, nice, nice fresh approaches. When we get set up to move on, I would like to remind you that after the next section of the program, which deals with activities of daily living, we'll be opening our phone lines for your questions and comments. So if you have a question or comment, write it down and give it to your site coordinator. He or she will call us collect at 412-621-7161. We'll make note of your question, and when it's time for the question and answer session, we'll call you back and put you on the air. We'll take just as many calls as time permits. Before leaving transfers, I would like to ask you to refer to your teleconference information packet. If you look at pages 14 and 16, you'll see three diagrams. Before you attempt the transfers we've just been talking about, do make sure you review those diagrams, please. And as Louise and Jan said, make sure you perform the transfer that's most appropriate for the patient's needs. By the way, if you've been following along in your packet, you'll have noticed that there are additional diagrams. We hope that in the future you'll refer back to them. They should be a good and continuing source of information for you. Leaving transfers now, we come to our next area, Activities of Daily Living, ADLs. Mm -hmm. 